baggage, you just get, get on board. All you need is faith to hear the diesels humming. You don't need no ticket, you just thank the The train to Jordan is picking up passengers from coast to coast. Faith is key, open the doors of boredom. Set up. And for um, this amazing program, as you might imagine, it's incredibly humbling to follow Dick Gregory and terrifying. <laughs> Certainly is. <laughs> We thought we might start with, in many ways, the civil rights movement surrounds us today, right? And we're gonna see in the next few weeks a, a huge reiteration of images of the March on Washington. And yet those images, in many ways, um, Professor Simmons and I were talking, distort and constrain kind of what we know about the movement. And so we thought we might start with some of the ways that that history gets shrunk in our public conversations. Yes, uh, we were able to have some dialogue earlier and were able to talk about how the movement uh, is often projected and portrayed by the media. And I think earlier you talked about uh, good civil rights versus bad civil rights. And you know, this is one of the things about our culture. It's able to sanitize things and uh, what it projects are just the things that it wants projected. So of course, since we're uh, about to commemorate uh, and celebrate the March on Washington, all of us know that what we keep hearing over and over is Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. And of course he said that, but how many of us realize or know that that march was a march for jobs and freedom? And that part of the march has not been realized and nor, it, and nor is it celebrated. They were asking for economic justice for everybody. And they wanted the federal government to intervene by creating jobs or income for people. Do we ever hear about that? So this is one of the distortions uh, amongst the many, many distortions. And I think that your work on Mrs. Parks has helped to show how Mrs. Parks' story was distorted and how we never knew the real Mrs. Parks. And I can think of so many others who they have sanitized, how they project to us what it is they want us to remember. And we, of course, have to resist this sanitation and really understand what the movement was struggling for. So one of the things, right, we wanted to talk about was, was unsung heroes, right? And in many ways, it seems like a paradox to talk about Rosa Parks as an unsung hero. Um, but one of the things we were talking about is this, again, this way of sanitizing of, in Mrs. Parks' case, right, every school child knows Mrs. Parks, but she is, as my students like to call her, the bus lady, mm -hmm. right? She begins and ends on the bus. The New York Times eulogized her as the accidental matriarch of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And so there are many things, and in, and in many ways I think the civil rights movement gets endlessly talked about, and yet, that process of talking, and if we think about Mrs. Parks' funeral, right, 
that on the one hand, Mrs. Parks gets a huge national funeral, right? First woman, second African-American to lie in honor in the Capitol. Mm -hmm. And yet at that same time, what was being honored was not the movement that, that I think we need to remember today. Exactly. Yes, uh, you know, by focusing on one or two people and uh, really making them bigger than life, um, it prevents us from realizing that this was a movement of ordinary people who stepped out on faith and on their belief that we really could make a change. And they did extraordinary things, but they were just regular people. And I can speak for myself, Clearly, that's exactly what I was. And I can tell you, I was scared. I was terrified uh, during the sit-ins and uh, you know, to go to Mississippi as I did in 1964 uh, to uh, work on voter registration. Uh, I, was, I was not some extraordinary person. And many of us who joined the movement really uh, were shaped by that movement. And it's so important to know that it was a movement of people so that you know in this room that you too can change these unjust systems that we now live under, just as those of us in the 60s and 70s uh, stepped out on faith and on the belief that we could make a change this is why it's so important for you to understand the movement aspect, not just the individuals, the heroes, the sheroes. So let's. In many ways, I think one of the things we need today is, is more visions of how people were these long distance runners. How yes. did people do it? How do you do it? How you know, kind of holding up those models of people who do it year after year after year, right, long before we get to kind of the, the heroic period of the civil rights movement, as some scholars like to call it, right? They were doing it for decades before, they continue to do, to do it for decades later. So maybe you could share some either stories of people who, mm -hmm. or your own stories of how people did that kind of, how that yeah. long distance journey. Well, I think it's so important for us all to remember that the Civil Rights Movement didn't just come out of nowhere. Right. That this was a part of a long struggle that black people and others had been struggling for really since the beginning of this country because the uh, unequalness uh, not only uh, between blacks and whites, but between whites of different classes. I mean, this has always been a big problem here. So it's very important to contextualize the civil rights movement as a part of the long struggle that we continue to be engaged in to this very moment. But a couple of women that I always like to lift up when I have a chance uh, are two women from Laurel, Mississippi that nobody has ever heard of unless possibly they've heard me talk about them. Um, just as an example of these ordinary people who did extraordinary things that made a movement happen. And they are Mrs. Eberta Spinks, uh, and I hope maybe that name will uh, b remain in some of your memories, Eberta Spinks. She was a woman about 50 years old, and when I knocked on her door in June of 1964, I was nervous. We were trying to start a movement in a town that had no movement, and she came to the door, and I was sort of stumbling, and I said, well, I'm, I'm with COFO, and we want to start a movement, and she said, are you one of those freedom riders? And I didn't know if that was good or bad, but I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, come on in. I've been waiting on you all my life. Oh. 
And really, that was the beginning of the Laurel, Mississippi movement. Uh, and she said, I have a neighbor. And this woman was in her late 60s. She said, she's been waiting for you too. And so there were four of us. And she said, I'll take the two women. And Mrs. Carrie Clayton, who was her neighbor, took the two guys. And that was the beginning of the project. And we really had our office on Mrs. Clayton's back porch because nobody would rent to us. But those two women were able to basically make the churches open their doors to us. So this is just an example of two women, one of whom was a widow, Mrs. Clayton, and another woman who had a family. And they were really putting their lives and their homes on the line by taking us in. And so they were the beginning of what became a very successful movement in Laurel, Mississippi. I want to talk a little more about that courage. And I think part of, again, the way that the movement is represented, of course it was courageous, but we don't spend very much time in what that courage Mm -hmm. is and what that courage takes and what are the components of it. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about them and how and, and their courage. Yes. Well, certainly, um, as I said, you know, I, I often mention that for those of us who were in SNCC, uh, you know, we had made this commitment and so we were there, but we always could hop the Greyhound and go home. As, but not Mrs. Clayton, Mrs. Finks, and all the others. This was home. Mm -hmm. And in the case of these two women, they were homeowners. And they could have lost their homes. Uh, they uh, could have lost jobs. Many people did. Uh, but they took a chance because they wanted to vote. They wanted the right to vote. And there were people all over the South who did this. And it was amazing when you think of it in retrospect, because as I often tell my students, you cannot imagine the terror these people lived under. I mean, th the fear that we all lived under. Every time you got in your car, you didn't know if you were gonna be killed, if somebody was trailing you, they had your license plates, uh, the phone was ringing all the time with threats uh, late into the night. Uh, and I must say that Mrs. Finks sat up all night with a shotgun across her lap. And she would say to us, you can go to sleep because Miss Finks is watching. <laughs> and I mean, it, this, this is something that we often don't know about. I mean, it was hell. And we were living under a system of terror that included all the elected officials, as well as the Klan. So I think many of us have been watching the Dream Defenders in Florida, yes? Yeah. Woohoo! <laughs> the amazing thing that's unfolding in Florida right now. And Professor Simmons um, has had many of the Dream Defenders in class. Uh, and one of the things we were um, texting about earlier today was sort of what, what kinds of lessons from the movements of the 50s and 60s and 70s right, that we don't get, would we like to give to them as they continue this incredible sort of sit in, you know, in many ways takeover of, um, yes. of, of the Florida uh, capital. So give us a story you would send to them. Well, and again, I, I always say to them, as I'll say now, you know, times were different then. So, of course, some of the strategies that we use then may not work now. But, uh, of course, one of the big differences, I think, is the role that religion played uh, in the Southern struggle. It, it was a very big part of it. And the singing and how the songs, 
which had been African American spirituals, were converted into freedom fighting songs, you know. And I think that's quite different. I mean, for instance, uh, when we have rallies, we're more likely to have rappers uh, who are rapping. And, but nonetheless, uh, I've certainly encouraged them and I think they already knew that we need music as a part of the movement. Um, the other thing, of course, was that we lived with the people. Uh, this was one of the things that SNCC did that was very different, say, from SCLC, and that is that we actually moved into the homes, we lived with them, we ate whatever they ate, we slept wherever they provided for us to sleep, and so we became members of those communities in a way that I'm not sure is going to happen now. But this was a major part of the success of SNCC and the work it did across the, the Deep South. Um, so what I try to do with them is to say, now this is what we did. This is not necessarily what you're going to do because times have changed and we're not fighting the overt uh, violent racism that we were. Obviously, you know, I'm in Florida, so the, the ugly violence has raised its head again where it's open season on African-American males in particular. But I think that the, the idea that I really try to convey is that people, regular people, made the change. It didn't come from the top. It came from the bottom. And this is what you can do as we were able to do. Right, and it's regular people, and it's not necessarily regular people whose colleges support them, right? Oh. It's not necessarily regular people whose parents support them. That's true. That's true. Do you want to tell them a little? <laughs> well, certainly, um, I was at Spelman College in Atlanta and uh, pretty much hounded out of school. I mean, people are shocked to know that a traditionally black college uh, during the 60s didn't support its students being involved in the civil rights movement, and that was the case. I mean, it was really horrible. When I think back on it, uh, you know, I'm amazed that I was constantly being called into the dean's office, threatened, and I was, you know, there on full scholarship, first person in my family to go to college. So I was really scared because, you know, I thought they're gonna throw me out. So that was the thing. And neither did my family support me. And I, you know, was very hurt about that. But of course, uh, after becoming a parent myself, I really understood that it was not that they were opposed to the movement, they were opposed to me being in it and possibly getting killed. So a lot of us went against our families, our schools, uh, in order to, to do this work. And I know some of the Dream Defenders are struggling with whether they're going to stay in college or take some time off to work full time in this work. So they are confronted with the same issues that I was confronted with. Um, can we talk a little bit more about women in the movement? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the, the if we're going to talk about the March on Washington, one of the things we have to talk about, right, is the ways that the March on Washington, no women got to speak. Right. That's very true. And um, I just uh, heard an interview, there's a new book out uh, on the march. And of course, I was fully aware that women did not have speaking roles and that there was a woman who really challenged A. Philip Randolph and the others about that, and they basically ignored her. And the women were not uh, passive about this. They were very upset. But because of their dedication to this, they decided not to make a big issue of it because at one point there was even talk of the women boycotting the stage. But they decided to go along with it because basically they put race before gender, as women of color have often done. 
but what happened immediately thereafter, they met uh, Dorothy Hyde, who was the head of the uh, National Council of Negro Women. They started meeting, and out of that meeting really came now, and we rarely, if ever, hear about the fact that it was African American women who were in the very beginning of the creation of now, and yet we often think that it was white women right. only who did that. Thank you. So that I think that uh, the role of women uh, and I'm, you know, I must say that because of women scholars like yourself, more and more we are learning about the role of women. And my colleague Dottie Zellner, who was in the trenches in SNCC, uh, along with myself and so many other women, I think more and more we're learning about the role. I would dare say that there wouldn't have been a civil rights movement without the women. Uh, it's just the reality. <clears throat> and yet until recently, you know, other than Mrs. Parks, you didn't hear about the women. How many of you have heard of Ella Baker? I mean, and how many know that Ella Baker was not only the godmother of SNCC, which she was, it was her idea to bring the students together who had been sitting in all across the South. She saw that this was a movement of borning, and she was the one who got the money, got the place uh, to hold that first meeting, she really advised the students, do not become an appendage of the NAACP or SCLC, but become your own organization. And that's exactly what we did. But we rarely know that she was also the brains behind the SCLC. And so here is a woman unknown to most people who was the brains uh, behind the founding of these two major civil rights organizations. I mean, but also, of course, all across the South, it was the women who took us in, who gave us the housing, who provided us with the food, and as they were often the people who were the backbones of the churches, they forced their ministers to open their doors so that we could have our freedom schools there, so that we could have uh, our voter registration drives there. So while many of them, like Mrs. Sphinx and Mrs. Clayton, they didn't want any speaking roles, but they were behind the scenes making it happen. And we should always remember that. Thank you very much for coming Thank you. Out.